if I if I can, uh, Patrick, start with you and ask you about this net zero carbon uh, target. What does it mean, and, and and what is it? Does it matter if oil companies, having committed themselves to this, uh, uncommit themselves to it? Uh, good uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody, and good afternoon, the wide world. I'm happy to meet you again for the spring. And uh, it has been very busy the last three months, to be honest, for everybody in the oil and gas industry. But I must say that uh, we've done uh, quite well in the last two months. Uh, so I would uh, like to answer to your question because you are right, Tanya. We have just announced our commitment to climate, uh, climate neutrality uh, beginning of May in the minute crisis. I would say it's, uh, it's quite, uh, it's, we have announced it because it's fully uh, in line with our strategy. And what is the strategy of the company is to, uh, uh, to, to, be, to be aligned, to be in phase with the evolution of the energy markets. Uh, you know, the climate change and the dual challenge that we are all facing is uh, on one side that we need to bring more affordable energy to everybody on the planet. And on the other side, we need less carbon emissions. This is a dual challenge which means that uh, the markets, the energy markets, will evolve in the future if they want to cope with both. More energy, more affordable energy, but less carbon. So that means that there are trends, and we cannot fight about the trends because new technologies are there, because the society is winning as well, and you have some policies, regulations, which are put in place in different parts of the world in order to push towards the ultimate uh, ultimate uh, challenge, which is uh, to, to fight against the climate change. So what does that mean, in fact, for a company like Total? It means that we want to, we are today producing mainly oil and gas, of course, which are, in fact, the core of all the energy uh, world markets. But tomorrow, we will have new energies, and in particular, the economy will be uh, more electrified, I would say. So when you look to the uh, energy markets, electricity will grow by far more than the other source of energy. And so we have decided to engage to develop the company in this, uh, exactly like Saudi Arabia, in this low carbon electricity business. Low carbon electricity means renewables and natural gas, uh, power, uh, power the gas fire power plant. And so we will, in fact, change our business model step by step from an oil and gas company to a broad energy company, a multi energy company, producing, of course, oil, but mainly, uh, I would say, an oil must be driven by uh, low-cost oil because in this new energy market, the world will probably uh, will see a plateau of oil production, so we need to take care of the cost of production of oil, like in Saudi Arabia. We'll promote natural gas because obviously natural gas is a good energy transition to go from uh, the actual world to the new world, and we will develop as well in uh, uh, renewable energy and uh, low carbon electricity, as I, as I said. Last piece of the, of the puzzle will be to invest in uh, uh, what we call negative technologies in terms of capturing CO2, either by nature based solutions or by carbon capture and storage. And so we will not do it again, this carbon neutrality, alone with this carbon neutrality. We have a strategy. We'll be able to achieve it together with the society. Because obviously, it's partly embarking of customers. You know, when you change your supply mix, it will work to go to carbon neutrality only if the customers are following us. So we need to convince them, which, is, which means also to, to deliver again some affordable energy to them with new source of energy. And that's a big challenge that we will face. Thank you very much. Well, we'll come back to this issue also of investors that we may. But first of all, Shambani, if I can come uh, to Mukesh Shambani. And I've still introduced Reliance as being uh, a diversifying company. So obviously the parameters are slightly different for you. How do you see this challenge um, put up by the oil majors of becoming a net zero carbon? Thank you, Tanya, and greetings to everybody. Uh, Your Royal Highness, it's a privilege and pleasure to be with you on this uh, panel. <clears throat> the way I see it is uh, that in the progress that humankind has made over the three industrial revolutions, we have disturbed the carbon cycle. Right? We have, uh, uh, and now it is time to use technologies, as His Royal Highness said, and Patrick said, to reset that balance and 
adopt the carbon cycle. Right? It's not only imperative for us to be net carbon zero, but I think that we have to recycle carbon. I believe that uh, Mother Nature is the best uh, technology that no humankind can ever do, and she teaches us how to recycle. Uh, last hundred and we've forgotten the carbon cycle. Uh, His Highness reminded us about that, and I think that Saudi Arabia in the G20 summit is putting this on the global agenda. Uh, we have to adopt technologies, and I think that for us in the energy business, it is not so much about uh, decarbonization, but it is really about uh, really completing the cycle. And I think that uh, uh, renewable or clean fuels, right? I think about the business as a very simple framework. And energy is an essential requirement for all the 8 billion people on this earth. Uh, there is need to provide efficient, clean, affordable energy. Uh, and we have to do it in a responsible way. That's the business. We shouldn't confuse that between clean and unclean. Uh, I think that uh, where we are, if we take a clean sheet of paper, we can adopt technologies whereby we can complete the uh, energy cycle. We can adopt new technologies, particularly of the biochemical photosynthesis route, whereby we can, instead of treating carbon dioxide as a liability, we can make that as a raw material. There are new progresses in uh, the electrochemical routes in the catalytic routes whereby we can still complete the uh, carbon cycle. I don't think that just uh, one solution will fit all. The important thing also is to allow energy equity. That means uh, if you, everybody has to have access to clean energy for their quality of life at an affordable price and the challenge for industry. And I am again a big believer that the challenge for industry and the purpose of industry is prosperity of all people, that is supply of energy on an affordable basis, is prosperity of the planet. And only after these two can there be prosperity for the companies or the shareholders. And I think with uh, where we are today in the coming decades, uh, we have no choice but to meet these challenges, to complete the carbon cycle and uh, serve the energy needs of all its customers rather than thinking in terms of fossil and renewable and wind and so Patrick, very briefly, if I could just come back to you and ask you this question. It seems that um, customers are very uh, on board, you know, consumers are very on board. Very on board. What about investors? Uh, what about investors and are they going to see um, production of oil somehow falling off after 2050? What will happen to oil production and how will investors see that? Just briefly, if you would. But I think, you know, it's not a black and white story. You know, even in 2050, they will still produce uh, some oil in all the uh, scenarios, even in a 1.5 degree scenario. Maybe only half of today, but Saudi Arabia is safe, you know, don't worry. This oil of Saudi Arabia will be continue to be produced uh, because it's the lowest cost of oil, lowest, the uh, best oil, you know, the lowest cost of oil. So, I mean, it's not, uh, it's, uh, investors, you know, today, uh, there are different camps of investors. Uh, and it depends where you are in the world. You know, in Europe, of course, you have a strong push of society, and my European shareholders are very pushing us to go towards the low carbon economy. And you can observe that today, uh, all these green companies, by the way, because of scarcity, are really uh, in, have incredible multiples, but mainly because of scarcity. You don't have many, many really green companies, you know, you have all companies. On the other side of the Atlantic, you know, when I'm looking, discussing with my US. Orders, it's mixed, you know, uh, because these, these guys, they know that maybe because it's, the U.S. are also a large oil and gas country, you know, more than in Europe. But uh, so the investors are not exactly, uh, it depends on the culture, I would say, in the continent. Europe is at the forefront of this fight. The European society is embarking in the Green Deal. And by the way, for a company like Total, it can give us some opportunities. You know, it's really 
like it's the case Europe is embarking the hydrogen economy, like they want to do it. Uh, I see that as an opportunity to engage also my company in this hydrogen business and maybe to, to take some advance uh, compared to other competitors. Uh, but again, the real uh, roadmap, the real challenge for us is to find the right pace towards this neutrality. You know, because on one side we are pushed to go very quick, and on the other side we know that uh, investing in energy requires billions of dollars, and we need to continue to produce oil to get billions of dollars in order to reinvest in this new energy. There is no miracle there. Uh, we cannot just borrow money from coming from nowhere, like it seems possible during the pandemic. Uh, and so that's, that's also a virtuous circle that we want to put, put in place. We have the conviction that they are in total, or we have a clear roadmap, uh, which means that the next step is to, in 2030 to, continue, to produce 15% of green electrons in our portfolio, 15.5. Today it's less than 5%. To continue to produce 45% of oil and 40% of gas. And to do that, we need to invest each year or between $2 billion these years and maybe 2 to $3 billion in, in these green electrons, you know. And the rest of the investments will continue to be focused on natural gas, and oil in the company. So there is a possible, a possible roadmap, continuing also to, uh, to give some returns to our stakeholders, to our shareholders. So that's, a, that's a, of course, to do that, to be honest, I prefer OPEC to stick with current policy and to have $40 plus than to be at $20 per barrel, because there, the, 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 it will be tough. So obviously, it's easier, but I think it's, by the way, the message is good for, even if you want to, yeah. to really we believe in climate change, it's better to have a higher oil price for everybody than a, a price which would be too low because then the people will be lazy and you know the lowest energy and the most efficient one will be oil. So I think for climate change it's even better for everybody to have a higher price and 40 plus is better for everybody. Right. I'd like to we're running out of time, so I'd like to come back to your Royal Highness and ask this this you've touched on it before but this this backdrop of covid 19 what does it do to do you think to oil companies ambitions to move ahead in this direction what does it do to uh ha has it jump started the process or has it ha will it act as a drag do you think you will have no, no i i see it that uh, it is a virus uh but i see it, it is a challenging virus because it, it just uh, brings a serious bill that we, the whole world, should adapt to the idea of create, working together to mitigate viral, viral diseases and spend more and allocate more money on, on, on healthcare program to ensure that uh, whatever we went through in the first episode of the first two months should not be repeated uh, globally. But I believe the challenge is more of a medical. However, since this medical situation hampered and really reduced the will of people to overcome the economic uh, impact of it, because again, I cannot recall even in any uh, period of history that uh, this world economy has ever been uh, uh, impacted in such a way or affected in such a way or is challenged in such a, a way. But uh, and I, I believe that, you know, we, we should not, even if we mitigate it and it's all, it's all quiet in the Western Front, that uh, we just uh, cheer it and then move on. Uh, because I believe that uh, the, this virus is, uh, has its own sirens of uh, wanting to, from the whole world to be attentive to viral diseases and attend to it properly. Be it as it may, I guess that uh, what this uh, uh, situation also created as a challenge, additional challenge, is that people need not to take things for granted. And people need to be careful about the trajectory of the future in case if they uh, get to be misled by the existing of today's number and how they see these trajectories. Uh, uh, Patrick and they see a lot of economists and they tell them and they tell me all these nice fancy uh, progressive growth and progressive and none of them just shows us what would happen to a crisis uh, of natural crisis or 
medical crisis as such would do uh, and how people can be ready to mitigate it. Uh, without that, uh, I think that sense of readiness uh, would not be there. Uh, and, and therefore, okay. I believe that what this thing has done for everybody is I think that the hardest and toughest lesson that is learned is that that, that has not take things for granted. There are all sorts of things that could happen to the world that can uh, sway us to, to be much more prudent and, and careful and cautious on how we attend to the future. Mr. Ambani, just, just just very briefly, if you would, um, what about PIF partnership and and how you engage outside the company um, in order to make this happen? Well, I think that uh, for us, particularly in India, uh, we have a high growth rate of energy. So it is important uh, that uh, one works with consumers and one spreading awareness. Uh, this virus itself has helped uh, uh, everybody realize the benefit of, uh, of, uh, of the low carbon mindset. So we engage outside and I think the real touch with the community, understanding the community at the, on the ground level and understanding different sectors of the economy and getting them involved in the energy movement is critical for uh, having a part to restore the carbon cycle. Your Royal Highness, what will happen to oil production after 2050? It's a question I put to Patrick earlier on, and it's um, a question that we've had coming in as well from Kola Karim, CEO of Shoreline Energy International. Is there a short answer to that question? You know, uh, I'm very grateful for the, the question. You know, I wish you were with us today this morning. I was working with a dream of young Saudi, uh, working on a program we call it uh, Hydrocarbon Sustainability Program, which is, uh, I believe, even Total is involved with us in that program, uh, uh, which is how to make sure that we uh, use our molecules of hydrocarbon and put it to good use in an environmentally safe way, commensurate with what the world would be in the future. I can assure you Saudi Arabia will be not only the last producer, but Saudi Arabia would produce every molecule of hydrocarbon and it would put it to good use uh, and it would be done in a most environmentally safe and sound way and it's the more sustainable way. And we live, we love challenges. And I love the idea of being challenged. And I love the idea that I have a, a young crowd uh, uh, who live to live a life of challenging life. You know, uh, I think uh, we're, we, we in Saudi Arabia are just gone beyond the so-called political correctness or social correctness to one of saying no. There is a challenge for us. We would have to live up to that challenge, which is we are sitting on a huge amount of hydrocarbon. We'll make better use of it. We have a serious program on how to convert oil and, and gas to uh, chemicals. We have we, where we would can go beyond that of primary chemical to secondary and tertiary, and we go all the way to the even, uh, you know, today as we speak, we just realized as a result of COVID, and I'm sorry to take much of your time, that we have the ability to produce all the nine uh, N95s. We haven't done that. We're doing it right now. All the PPEs, because we have the right it's a mark. ingredients. The, N95 is a mark. Yeah, the PPEs, we will be producing it. We are now producing sanitizers. Just it takes discipline and a committed people. You should come and see the young uh, men and uh, young uh, boys and girls of Saudi Arabia, how much they aspire to be challenged and how much they are inspired to, to attend to these challenges. And the kind of enablers and the kind of uh, that are in existence today 
is uh, one that enables them to say, I can reach out to these goals. So we will be setting the pace. Uh, I know that Patrick and Mokush, they know us well. Not only that, we would live to that, uh, uh, to that challenge, which is we will be the pace setters. So in 2050, I would not be there, but I'm willing to tape something to say, we will be the last and biggest producer of, of hydrocarbon, even then. Thank you very much indeed, Your Royal Highness. I'd also like to thank Mr. Patrick Poyani of Total and Mr. Mukesh Ambani of Reliance Industries. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.